Over the last year or so, a friend of mine has been collecting all the expansion sets for a deck-building card game called Legendary. We've been playing this game pretty often, and with all the expansions, there are a lot of different cards to deal with. The board for the original game fails to account for all the cards needed to play with the expansions, and my friend and I have also added some custom cards of our own. I've been thinking of building a custom board for this game for a few months now, and so in this video, I'll be doing just that. I'll be using my Xcarve 3D carving machine for part of this project, which I got from Inventables about two years ago and was first used in my videos to build cigar box guitar necks. This project was sponsored by Inventables, but the project itself is one that I've had planned for a long time before I talked to them about this video. What Inventables has sponsored this project to promote is a new Maker Challenge series using their free 3D carving software Easel. You can enter these challenges by submitting your own designs like the one I'll be making in this video, and you don't need an X-Carve to participate. You just need to draw a game-related design that can be cut with Easel and post a screenshot to the Inventables website where they're currently giving out gift cards as rewards. Links are in the description below, but let's get started with my project. First of all, I needed to clean up my X-Carve. I never did run all the wires properly when I first assembled the machine, so it was a bit of a mess. A new motor controller had been released in the meantime as well, so I wanted to install that upgrade also. The new brain of the machine, called the X controller, took a little bit of assembly, but is clearly a big upgrade from the old model. After some wire management that I really should have done a long time ago, it was an easy switch to install the connections into the new controller and get things up and running again. Now to come up with the new design for my game board, I started with an image of the original. I imported this image into a vector-based drawing program called Inkscape, which is a free program that you can download yourself. I then roughly traced a few of the game areas to get an idea of how large I should be making various sections of the board in relation to one another. Instead of tracing every section, a better way to maintain consistency is to copy and paste similar areas so you know they're exactly the same size. After some time moving things around and making sure I had places for all the cards that my friends and I usually play with, this is my final design. I can save this image as an SVG file, which is the file type required for a 3D carving program like Easel to interpret into machine code that the Xcarve can use to cut the design. Easel is a browser-based program that once opened allows my SVG file to be imported, and then further modified within the program to tell the carving machine how deep to make each cut and how large the design is meant to be overall. My design is scaled to about 74 centimeters wide, which is just about right to make the board spaces match the size of the playing cards. The depth of my cuts is set to 2 millimeters, and I'm ready to give this design a test on the machine. This, by the way, is where you could stop if you just wanted to enter the maker challenges on Inventables. Just post a project screenshot that is ready to cut with easel, and you're in. This material that I'm cutting now is not what my game board will be made of, but I'm using this cheap fiber board just to test that the design comes out how it's supposed to before trying to cut more expensive materials. At one point during this cut, I accidentally shut off the power, and since I failed to precisely mark my zero point on the cutting surface, I ended up with an error. This happened because I incorrectly guessed where the original zero point was, and started cutting again lower on the board than I had the first time. I'm glad I did a test. From this I learned it's a good idea to put down a piece of masking tape and use one of the corners as a zero point. If the cut gets interrupted, I now know precisely where to resume cutting from. In fact, for this design, I know the cut will be interrupted because once I've cut out all the borders for the card spaces, I need to switch to a smaller bit to cut the finer details. Easel is smart enough to know that if I tell it that I'm cutting with a large bit, it will be too large to precisely cut the lettering in my design, so it only cuts the card spaces. Once it has completed cutting all the larger details, I simply go back into the program, delete all the sections that have already been cut, and tell Easel that I have installed a smaller cutting bit. The smaller bit is zeroed on the corner of my tape, and cutting is resumed to finish my test. The result was really quite good, despite the errors I caused. I did do a second test, just to be sure, on the back side of the board, and I think I'm ready to cut the real thing. It actually took quite a long time for me to decide what material I wanted to use to make my final game board. I thought about using PVC board like I did for the mold in my parabolic mirror project. That would be an easy material to work with since it's perfectly flat and doesn't struggle with the inconsistency of organic materials like wood. But on the other hand, I don't get very many chances to practice carpentry and I'd really like to improve my woodworking skills. 
I decided to make my board from two maple planks that I found at a local home improvement store. Such places are not usually known for quality lumber, but I think I got lucky in finding these pieces with some really beautiful patterns. We'll see how it turns out. I needed to cut these into short sections to glue together into one wide slab. My two planks looked quite different from one another, so it was kind of tricky to figure out how to organize them in a way that I thought would look nice. Now to glue boards together like this, the correct way requires a tool called a jointer, which makes their edges perfectly flat. I don't have a jointer, so this was the part I was most nervous about. The edges of the boards are certainly not going to come together perfectly, and it's pretty well hopeless for me to expect a completely level surface once the glue dries. The best case scenario is that it will be adequately flat, and any issues will be minor enough that I can fix them with sanding. I was pretty happy to have a chance to use these pipe clamps. I bought them at a garage sale and thought that I probably had wasted my money on something I would never use, but maybe I'll do stuff like this more often now. About 24 hours later, I could take the clamps off and inspect the result. There's a lot of excess glue, but for the most part it seems to have worked. A few boards were sticking up higher than others and had to be sanded way down, but otherwise I think I have a surface that's flat enough to carve. I don't think I'll do the belt sanding in my basement next time though. When I set the slab on the cutting surface of my X-carve, I did notice that it was slightly warped. But that's something I should be able to fix by adding bracing later, and in the meantime I can hold it flat against the table with clamps. Okay. Maybe I won't cut this at right this moment, seeing as how the power just went out. All right, delay. <laughs> Gosh. Once it seemed like my power had stabilized, it was the moment of truth. I marked a zero point on my board and started cutting. The chips that the carving bit threw off from this nice hard maple were a lot larger than the powdery fiber board I cut my tests on, and so the cuts looked a lot nicer from the start. Once the X-Carve started cutting the pattern on the right-hand side of the board, I did notice that the cuts were shallower, which means I probably sanded that portion of the board thinner than on the other side to correct my gluing errors. To fix this, I waited until the X-Carve had finished cutting all of the card outlines, and then I went back into easel and had the machine cut the borders on the right-hand side again, this time a little deeper than before. Fortunately, that worked very well. When I moved on to cutting the text with the smaller bit, I also told Easel to cut a little deeper on the right side than on the rest of the board. I was certainly nervous something would go wrong with my last minute adjustments, but it came out looking quite nice. The cutting bits left just a small burr, around the lettering especially, but this is easily removed with some fine sandpaper. The board really could be used as is, but I had my heart set on making it slightly elevated, and I also still need to deal with it being warped, as I mentioned earlier. Some 1x3 maple cross bracing on the bottom should do the job. I start with one brace that will go diagonal from corner to corner. This brace is the one that will be able to hold the most strain and is easiest to clamp, so I want it to meet the corners that are warped upward. Clamping the brace this way should have made the whole board much more level, so the braces going in the other direction will only have to be clamped lightly. Now if you have an angle gauge, you can make these two split cross braces meet directly in the middle. But if you don't feel like measuring, all you have to do is cut the end of each brace at the same angle. It doesn't matter what that angle is. Then you match the cut to the side of the center board and slide them along until the far end is positioned in the corner. You'll be left with this sort of offset bracing which almost looks like it was intentionally stylistic, rather than an aversion to tricky measurements. Finally, I think this is the part that every woodworker looks forward to, applying a finish. This is when you really get to see what the wood looks like and the grain starts to stand out. I'm using a finish called shellac, which I've never used before, but I like it. The solvent it's dissolved in is alcohol, so it's a lot less noxious than some of the other finishes I've worked with. The finish dries quite fast, so only an hour or so later, I was ready to install some rubber feet as the final step. The board was almost exactly level after adding the bracing, but it still did need a few washers under the feet to make it perfect. Of course I added the washers to the wrong feet, so I flipped the board back over again and got it right the second time. As I mentioned at the start of this video, this project was sponsored by Inventables. 
and my board design is the first entry in their Game Maker Challenge using the free 3D carving software Easel. They have previous challenge topics like fidget spinners and mosaic tiles, so whether you want to make a game design or any of the other Maker Challenge subjects, just send a screenshot of your project in Easel their way through the links in the video description below. You can earn gift cards just for submitting entries, with the maximum amount currently at $115 for each challenge. That's a good portion of the way toward paying for a carving machine for yourself, or at least a whole bunch of materials to make other projects with. I hope you enjoyed this video. I still read all of your comments, so leave me some feedback below, and thanks for watching.